Good evening, folks. My name is John Good, and I'm sure glad you people could come here tonight. You got to be real special people to come to hear someone that likes me talk to you. Now, I was christened 60 years ago, John Good, and you may think it's kind of funny when you hear more about me that they took me to a church, sprinkled holy water on me, and then asked God to make John Good be good. Fact of the matter is, I ain't been very good for most of my life, and I sure ain't been able to look God straight in the eye or tell him what a fine, upstanding fellow I'd been. Truth be told, it wasn't that long ago that I would have just as soon robbed good folks like yourselves as talk to you, and it wasn't that long ago that I got out from another stint in Sing Sing prison. You see, prisons in the streets have been my home for as long as I can remember. But that's enough about my sad tale. I want to tell you about what changed John Good into somebody who don't rob folks no more, who can think of somebody else besides himself, and who can even feel ashamed of the things that I did in the past. Now, if you were to talk to my pals from the street at a pen, they'd say there ain't nothing going to break John Good. Being kicked out in the street when he was 10 years old didn't do it. Twenty years in prison didn't do it, and even being hung up on my thumbs in Sing Sing didn't do it. Now, they'd say it would take a miracle to change John Good. Well, you know, folks, I reckon it was a miracle that changed me, and it's that miracle that I got to tell you about. It's the story about the servant. Now, I call Abdul Baha a servant. Some folks call him the master, but I heard him say he didn't much like that name. All he wanted to be called was the servant of God. That's all he's ever wanted to be all his life was just a servant. I've been disobeying God for most of my life and said I was going to stop. So if the son of the messenger of God wants me to call him servant, hey, that's good enough for me. I'll call him servant. And I reckon what I'm trying to be is a good servant of that servant. Now this miracle started for me back in February of 1912. I was fresh out of prison and wandering the streets. It was blowing up a snowstorm, so me and the guys thought we'd head for the Bowery Mission to get some grub and get warm. After supper, this fine society couple come in, a Miss Juliet Thompson and a Dr. Hallamand, wanting to talk to us. Well, we've had plenty of these goody two-shoes coming to talk to us and give us their religion. But we thought, what the heck, we ain't got nothing else to do. Why not? Maybe we'll get a few laughs out of it. But you know, they didn't say what we was expecting. Miss Thompson told us about this special man from the Holy Land that was coming for a visit to New York. And that this man spent 40 years of his life in jail. Well, that got our attention, because most of us knew about jail, and I don't know anybody that's had more jail time than I have. Then she said something else. She told us that this man had got out of prison full of love for the whole world. Well, that really got our attention. Because we know that when we got out of jail, we had nothing but hate for the whole world. Then Miss Thompson asked us if we would take a vote to see if we'd like to have this man come and talk to us. Well, all 300 of us stood right up to show we voted yes. Even Hannigan over there, who couldn't stand at the best of time from boozing, he jumped right up. I don't know what it was, but I kept my nose clean until April. And on the 19th, I made sure that I was first in line when they opened the steel doors at a Bowery Mission that night so that I could get a seat at a table right up near the front where I could see this holy man, this man who got out of prison full of love for the whole world. Later on that evening, there was a noise outside with cars pulling up. And pretty soon, in walked this little old man, surrounded by a bunch of guys the likes that we'd never seen before in our life. There was Miss Julia Thompson again, and a lady reporter from the New York Tribune. Mm -hmm. 
and five other guys wearing these pillbox type hats. I think they call them a fez. And looking like they come from Egypt or Persia or some strange place. Well, they come down and met the reverend who runs the mission. And then they got up on a stage that was set up at one end with a table and some flowers on it. Then Miss Thompson got up and introduced this holy man to us as Abdul Baha or a master. He was kind of a smallish man and fairly old. And he had a white turban and a long white beard and a long cloak that went right down to the floor. And when he got up to speak, I knew he was saying the words in some foreign language and one of the guys in the fez was saying the words in English. But you know, it sounded to me as if he was the only one talking and that he was talking just to me. I can remember most of what he said as if it was yesterday. Tonight I'm very happy for I've come here to meet my friends. I consider you my relatives, my companions, and I am your comrade. You must be thankful to God that you are poor for Jesus Christ has said, Blessed are the poor. He never said, Blessed are the rich. He said too, that the kingdom is for the poor and that it is easier for a camel to enter a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter God's kingdom. Therefore you must be thankful to God that although in this world you are indigent, Yet the treasures of God are within your reach. And although in the material realm you are poor, yet in the kingdom of God you are precious. Jesus himself was poor. He did not belong to the rich. He passed his time in the desert, traveling among the poor and lived upon the herbs of the field. He had no place to lay his head, no home. He was exposed in the open to heat, cold and frost, to inclement weather of all kinds. Yet he chose this rather than riches. If riches were considered a glory, the prophet Moses would have chosen them. Jesus would have been a rich man. When Jesus Christ appeared, it was the poor who first accepted him, not the rich. Therefore, you are the disciples of Jesus Christ. You are his comrades. For he outwardly was poor, not rich. Even this earth's happiness does not depend upon wealth. You will find many of the wealthy exposed to dangers and troubled by difficulties. And in their last moments upon the bed of death, there remains the regret that they must be separated from that to which their hearts are so attached. They come into this world naked, and they must go from it naked. All they possess, they must leave behind and pass away solitary, alone. Praise be to God. Our hope is in the mercy of God and there is no doubt that the divine compassion is bestowed upon the poor. Jesus Christ said so, Baha'u'llah said so. While Baha'u'llah was in Baghdad, still in possession of great wealth, he left all he had and went alone from the city, living two years among the poor. They were his comrades. He ate with them, slept with them, and gloried in being one of them. He chose for one of his names the title of the poor one, and often in his writings refers to himself as Darvish, which in Persian means poor, and of this title he was very proud. He admonished all that we must be the servants of the poor, 
helpers of the poor. Remember the sorrows of the poor associated with them, for thereby we may inherit the kingdom of heaven. God has not said that there are mansions prepared for us if we pass our time associating with the rich, but He has said there are many mansions prepared for the servants of the poor, for the poor are very dear to God. The mercies and bounties of God are with them. So, my comrades, you are following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Your lives are similar to His life. Your attitude is like unto His. You resemble Him more than the rich do. Therefore, we will thank God that we have been so blessed with real riches. And in conclusion, I ask you to accept Abdul Baha as your servant. After the master finished his speech, he went down and he stood by the door where we had to leave. And as each one of us got to him, he took our hands, looked in our eyes, and quiet like some, nobody could see, he pressed a quarter into our hand. Some of us who were really hard up, he gave four or five quarters to. For all 300 of us, he did this, gave us the price of a bed for the night and a meal that we could pay for ourselves. I can't tell you exactly how I felt when the servant got to me and when he took my hand and looked in my eyes. It was the strangest feeling, something I'd never felt before. All I can call it is love. The warmest, kindest, deepest love a man could feel during his time on this earth. Maybe I felt that same love 60 years ago when they sprinkled that holy water on me back in church. And maybe they knew something when in God's name they named me John Good, servant of the servant. You know, if you're lucky in this life, you wise up and you realize that God has a special love for you. It's just there for the taking. All you got to do is love him. And if you're poor and you've been dealt some bad cards, you shouldn't let it get you down or turn you into something no better than an animal. Because that love is better for you than anything money can buy. And if you're rich, (laughs) you shouldn't feel too good about that neither. Not unless you think having a coffin full of money is going to do you any good in the next life. Why, you let the poor suffer all around you in this life. Well, I, I think I better stop now. You can tell I'm starting to preach at you. When all I wanted to do was thank you for coming here tonight to listen to what a crude, uneducated guy like me has to say. It's real important for me to be able to tell you folks about my miracle, the one the servant gave to me. I really pray that all of you may be touched by that same miracle. It's just there for the taking. Thanks, and good night to y'all.